So guys, today we have the legend that is John Janch. And this is a huge, huge privilege for me to have John here as our first guest on Magic Mentor. Because I remember when I set out on my journey as a coach and a consultant, some of my mentors were recommending me books. And one of the first books that I got placed into my hands was John's Duct Tape Marketing. So getting to know John and understand more of his principles has been a treat, both through his written words and through getting to know him and have some conversations and be interviewed for his legendary podcast too, personally. But to have him here for you guys, I think is an awesome, awesome treat. So John, welcome. Hey, thanks, Phil. Boy, first interview, setting the bar. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's nowhere but up from here, I suppose, right? <laughs> something like that, something. So John, where in the world are you right now? I am in Kansas City, Missouri, right smack dab in the middle of the United States. Oh, wow. So good part of the U.S. I've done 35 of the states and um, Kansas is still somewhere I haven't been and Missouri is somewhere I still haven't been. So I need to get out and come and see you. Well, it's one of those I have to give a lot of geography lessons because I'm in Kansas City, but I'm in Missouri, which really, you know, really confuses a lot of people. Yeah. And I think most of the listeners right now are going to be in the U.K. and they'll have no idea where any of that is. So let's help them out a, sec a second. Tell us. Tell us where that is in that big land mass of the United States. So, so, so really the, the, the absolute center of the United States, if you were to measure, you know, with all the tools that they have, is about 40 miles from me. So uh, if you can imagine, you know, that, just uh, take a pin and put it about as close to the middle uh, on the map of the United States and you'll, you'll hit Kansas City. A um, couple you know, major rivers uh, you know, run through here and split and go off into many, many states. Uh, we're mostly plains. Um, for Kansas, or it's really the end of what they call the deciduous forest. I mean, we have so many ecosystems here in the United States, but uh, so the, the the Great Plains kind of start uh, really right here at, at our doorstep. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, John, you're very much talked about here in the U.S. as the small business marketing guy, that go-to guy when it comes to finding things that work that allow small businesses and entrepreneurs to to find themselves more customers. But how does one get started in becoming that? Give us a bit of a potted backstory. How do you turn to being the guy that everybody talks about today? Well, I think a great deal had to do with the fact that I, I really do love working with small business owners and, and I built my entire business, in fact, structured my entire business so that I could do that, even though that wasn't how I started. But I think another ingredient, quite frankly, is that you know, there were, there were a lot of companies, a lot of individuals, a lot of brands that just didn't care about small business that much. And uh, of course they do now, everybody wants to start a business now. And, and you see all these startup initiatives that are, that are well funded by, by enterprise and by, you know, large brands. Uh, but really going back 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. And so I think it partly timing and, and, and combined with a, really a passion for helping those folks. I, I had worked for very large organizations as well. And I, I just, I think there's something both equal parts terrifying and gratifying about working for that person who is actually going to write the check to pay for the results that you've got them. And, and I, I'm really very driven by kind of helping small business owners uh, because I think, I think quite frankly, you get this marketing part figured out. Not only do you grow your business and maybe make more revenue, but I think if you do it the way that, that we preach, at least you get your life back too. Hey, gotcha. So there's some balance in there. And where, where did this whole journey start for you, though? So where did you kind of realize that marketing was where it's at? Give us kind of a John Jans potty yeah. history. Well, I mean, right out of college, I actually went to work for an ad agency for about five years and just found that I, I was very unsettled. I wanted to do something new every day. I wanted to run my own show. And so I just, without really any planning, uh, started my own agency. And I, I think my uh, superpower, if I have one, is curiosity. I'm just <laughs> yeah. very curious about how things work and why they work and how they could work better and how you could apply something that nobody else was applying to you know, your situation. Um, and so, you know, I, I, that really led me to working with small businesses, quite frankly, because I, I think that's the life of the small business. And um, really, and we were talking, you know, off air about this uh, before, uh, before we started the, the interview, I found that I loved working with small business owners, but it was very hard. I mean, they had the same problems and challenges. And if I came in and said, what do you want? Okay, we'll go figure out how to do that. Um, I was really chasing my tail. It was very hard to be profitable. So I decided that I was going to create a, a very systematic and different approach to marketing and say, where I could walk in and say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. Here are the results we hope we can get. And by the way, here's what it costs. Do you want it or not? And okay. as a salesperson, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it got a lot easier. They either said yes or no. Um, and uh, if they said no, I was down the road. If they said yes, I said, okay, let's get, you know, here's the process for getting started. So it really simplified the world for me. And 
what I found, and of course this is where most brilliant innovations come from, what I found was uh, it was actually very frustrating for small business owners to figure out how to buy uh, marketing services. And so a lot of them told me, wow, this is, you know, this is a breath of fresh air. You know, you'll do it all. You'll start with strategy. I know what the price is. Um, this is great. Uh, so, uh, so that really turned into something that I knew I was on to something that, that, that could scale. Um, and that's actually the genesis of the name duct tape marketing. Cause I figured I, I then had to give it a more sort of product uh, kind of feel. And I, I just feel like that metaphor uh, duct tape marketing is a lot of what I think a lot of small business owners kind of, kind of feel like uh, uh, they go through, you know, simple, effective, affordable, the yeah. notes have to be pretty, but, but, but really works. Um, and, and, you know, for your listeners in the United States, I mean, they, there's also sort of this strange affection for duct tape uh, in the United States. It doesn't, doesn't always uh, um, translate <laughs> to some other countries, but uh, that, that metaphor makes a lot of sense for people in the United States at least. Now, now I've heard people talking about your work and that metaphor duct tape marketing. And I've heard some people talk about it as it's creating stuff that's sticky and sticks to everything. And I've heard some people talk about it as it's, well, it's a good enough job, it will patch something up when it's not. And then various differentiations in between. What, what does it really mean to you? Well, I think that that almost that tagline, you know, simple, effective, affordable, it you know, doesn't always have to be pretty, it just has to work. And I think yeah. that's, um, that to me is kind of the, the relationship that I think a lot of people have to duct tape. You're right. I mean, there, the negative potential of that concept or that metaphor is that, oh, you're just tacking it together. It's half, you know, half done, you know, but uh, um, I, I think that there, there are some very elegant <laughs> applications uh, of duct tape that you'll see as well. And I, I, that's where I kind of try to go. And I think, you know, I think most small business owners uh, kind of, you know, it also to them kind of speaks to that idea of maybe some things that are a little more affordable than, um, you know, than some traditional marketing or, or consulting practices. Okay. Now, let's think about small business owners for a second. Is I meet lots of them too. Many of the people in this group fall into that category. Many have this perfection paralysis hmm. when it comes to what needs to be done or they need to understand something in its entirety before they get started so they procrastinate and stand on the spot. Yeah. And marketing is this world of a million things you could be doing. And in today's day and age, I mean, my goodness, you can just spend your life spinning on a spot confused. How do people deal with that as a small business owner? Yeah. I must admit, I don't suffer from that perfection. <laughs> um, and, but, Me but, either. <laughs> the good but, is good enough in my world, but yeah. yeah. And I think that is... Um, I think that's become a challenge. When I started this, we had five or six ways that we could reach customers. And now we have about 16 channels that we have to at least acknowledge and in some cases participate in. Right. That, that fragmentation uh, is actually probably one of the greatest sources of stress, I think, for a lot of uh, business owners because they read about some one person who made a million dollars on Snapchat. And so all of a sudden, oh, I've got to be on Snapchat. Um, and, and what we try to do is, is acknowledge that those channels are there, but really then look at, okay, where do you really get your customers today? And, and if sales is it, if word of mouth is it, uh, if uh, SEO is it, well, then how can we actually, instead of saying we have to be everywhere, how can we look at another couple channels and say, okay, if, if, if sales is how we get most of our clients, how can we use these other channels to make sales stronger? How can we use content, for example, to uh, enable our salespeople to be more effective or to get involved in the customer journey at an earlier point? Right. That's what we try to do is, is and, and it really comes down to focus then, you know, so we, we may experiment in some other channels. We may have a hypothesis about, say, Facebook advertising, and we'll, we'll experiment and fail fast or, <laughs> or succeed um, and decide whether or not we want to then put energy into it. But a lot of my focus is helping people understand that they need to amplify what's already working instead right. of just fragmenting. Okay. So you talked there, you moved from six, seven channels to now you have 16 channels. We were talking with the group about choosing your channels just a couple of days back. And how do you choose then? Because yeah. you obviously had to evolve through that. Yeah. There are more than 16 channels. How do you pick where are you going to put your effort into? Yeah, well, again, as, as I stated, you start with, particularly if you've already got customers, you know, where do they come from? You know, how, what's been your most effective channel? And, and that's, you know, that maybe sounds like an oversimplification, but so often people want to give up on something that's actually working. I can't tell you how many people have told me over the years that they get most of their business by way of referral, and then they do absolutely nothing <laughs> like referrals. Right. Uh, and I think that that, you know, that's where we start. 
So you start with, you know, how's it happening? Okay, how can we then look at the channels that we think would make the most sense to integrate with that? Um, you know, if everybody feels like I need to be on social media, well, how can we use social media to actually amplify our sales channel or actually use it to amplify referrals instead of just get followers? Okay. Um, and I think that, so, so it's a mindset shift as well. Now, having said that, there are some cases where you know, somebody has, they've not been using advertising or they've not been using some, some very legitimate channels. And so we always want to be think about uh, experimenting, but not just throwing money at stuff, you know, experiment in a way that has a hypothesis that you can track, <laughs> that, that you can decide very quickly, hey, did this get us um, a, a desired result quickly or not? Okay. We talked about failing fast, right? You just said that's one of the things that you look to be able to do. You've yeah. probably seen a lot of failures, <laughs> mistakes through some of the people you've worked with, some of the things you've been bumped into. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you've got examples of that you see sure. currently? Well, and when I talk about failing fast, I'm, you know, I'm obviously not talking about desire to fail. <laughs> you know, I'm really talking about experimenting to eliminate uh, things so you don't waste your time there. Uh, but, so the, you know, the biggest failure, a couple of the biggest ones actually start back with strategy. <laughs> um, right. You know, not understanding who makes an ideal client for you as opposed to, hey, these people buy chiropractor services, you know, or might buy chiropractor services, so they're all my potential clients. Um, that's probably the, the the biggest one, and and you know we really spend a lot of time coaching small business owners on on understanding you know who they really are set up to serve, or who their product uh, really is set up to to deliver value to, and then narrowing our focus to to uh, in some cases as small a group as possible because we want to be seen by that small group as the only one who is set up to solve their problems and challenges because when you do that not only can you message the right message instead of just watering everything down but you also those people who who come to know like and trust you expect to pay a premium because you are so perfectly matched with what their problem or challenge or need is okay now you're a small business right now imagine that scenario but i'm talking small small business where what you've got is a great product and maybe you've partnered with another organization to help provide you that product. You're the sales arm of that. You need to build a tribe of happy customers. And the sum of money like 250 pounds, $250 or $500 is a huge expense to be able to put into your marketing. Time is limited. And um, you're being confused by the minefield out there. Put yourself in those shoes with that limited budget. What might be some of the things you'd look to do first? Well, the, the, the biggest thing that I, because believe it or not, I mean, that may be the bulk of people, especially somebody who's, who's trying to start something up, yeah. so get away from <laughs> the, the factory. Um, and, and, you know, for those folks, a lot of what, uh, you know, I try to do is tell them to start building uh, networking relationships. You know, that's one that you can do for zero money. Right. Be very strategic about it. That doesn't mean go to every event you can possibly find and talk to anybody within, you know, earshot. W one of the things I love to do is say, okay, who else has a community and already has a tribe that might, you know, that, that there might be a reason why they would want to partner with you um, or at least introduce you to their tribe because you have something um, that they think is, is valuable. Quite frankly, this interview is an example of what, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and is a great strategy to, to really start your business because in, in many cases, you know, if you have a few customers, those few customers might be able to introduce you to a handful of more people, but the right strategic relationships might be able to introduce you to, you know, a thousand or 2000 uh, people. And that to me is if you have, you know, no budget at all is absolutely one of the most cost effective ways that can actually have very large payoff. Right. And then I think one of the other things that people get attracted to right now, when you're thinking low cost, no cost marketing is they jump towards social. Yeah. And they sign up for every given platform that could be possible and start broadcasting content here, there, and everywhere. How do you decide what's essential and then how to behave on that? Well, I think the biggest thing, if, if you have limited budget and, and in some cases limited time, I think you just have to make a decision. Where do, the, where do most of the people that I think are my ideal customers hang out uh, and, and kind of go as deep as possible there? And Deep doesn't mean that you then start doing all kinds of crazy things and running contests to get Facebook likes. And, you know, I think you can, you can go deep in, in, in a, 
uh, platform without spending that much time or even having a huge following. One of my favorite ways to go deep into Facebook is to find groups that you believe will have your audience um, and to join those groups and be an active participating member of that group. I, I, I think a lot of the social networks, you know, when we first started, the Twitters and the LinkedIn's and the Facebooks, everybody was about, you know, how can I build this huge following and mass market to this huge following? And I think we've evolved to the, well, first off, people got tired of that. <laughs> and so yeah. I think we've evolved to the point where, you know, people go onto Facebook now to curate content, to find content, to find like-minded people that they can engage rather than just getting, you know, mass of followers who, will never come to really know them or engage. And, and so to me, you know, that kind of you know, using social to be social and using uh, social to engage people in a very personal and helpful way um, is I think where we are today with social media. Right. So if I'm to summarize that point, you're, you're almost saying, let's look for conversations you can join and contribute to as opposed to let's look to start as many conversations as possible. That's right. And, and I think that, you know, the temptation so often is to jump into one of those groups and go, oh, hey, <laughs> lots of buyers. Um, and, and obviously you have to resist that temptation. And, it, and it's, it's like any, you know, this is no different than going to your Chamber of Commerce event. I mean, you, you, you don't walk up to people and start, you know, passing that, well, people do walk <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but those people don't uh, last very long. Um, you, you find out how you can help people and, and you build relationships on, on that, that are mutually beneficial. So whether it's online or offline, it's find where your people hang out, yep. go hang out with those people, listen, 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 and find the contributions that you can make to their conversations where you can add value without being pushy to win that no like trust piece. That's right. And then opportunities start to happen. That sounds so simple. Why do people make it so difficult? Well, I, you know, quite frankly, there's a lot of pressure to eat and pay the bills. And, and so I think that that complicates things because a lot of times people are like, this all sounds great, but it sounds like it's going to take a lot of time. Um, and, and I think that that's probably the greatest uh, challenge is that, that you know, people need to make money. They need to make sales. And so a lot of times uh, uh, they, you know, they, will, they will shortcut you know, what it actually takes to build a loyal tribe. So, so how do you deal with the difference there then? I mean, you're a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. How do you take care of feeding the family today and building a scalable business for the future? How do you choose to balance that? Yeah, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because, you know, I'm, I have a tendency to really, you know, I told you about my curiosity while on top of being a, a, a superpower. It's also a curse at times um, because I, you know, I like to explore different things and uh, have things changing. But I, I I think that um, for many people, um, it, it it comes down to a comes down to having a vision for where you want to go, and and then having sort of that practical realization at times. It says, okay, I don't really want to. I want to build. Let's say I want to build a membership course, <laughs> but you know I need to build up the um, the the content. I need to build up the community. You know to where I will be able to sell that membership course. That's my life's vision. So what that means is maybe you then go out and find a couple of people that would be ideal for that membership course and you personally mentor them or you do consulting or you, know, you figure out ways to get paid to develop your vision. Um, and in some cases, those aren't things you're going to do long term. I mean, you're going to hopefully evolve out of those, but you've got to have that vision for where you're trying to go so that you can, um, I think, do the things in some cases that are going to be long term, but in some cases that are going to be short term that will help you get to where you're trying to go. Okay. So that's kind of like high ticket, low quantity to get you the wages on the table, but without scalability. Sometimes that's the job, right? Sometimes that's, right. that's somebody in their employed work that says, I've got to do this over here while I work on this in the long time and then, and then aim to be able to create some crossover point with those things. That's right. You know, overlap. When, you, when you have that mindset too, then all of a sudden things start showing up that would be a great fit for that long-term thing, but they happen to be in your job. Like maybe you start interviewing people for a podcast or something, you know, that's in your job. Um, but you start selecting those people or you start asking questions and having inquiry that, you know, are actually maybe a little bit of research for your, your, your other gig. Okay. I'm going to spin you in a different direction right now. And, and there's this buzz right now where everybody wants to be an expert, a speaker, a guru, a mentor, a coach, a consultant, whatever you choose to call it. It's like a trendy thing to be right now. Yep. You've been in this game a chunk of time. 
What are some of the lessons that you've learned for anybody who wants to grow their gravitas as that go-to expert? Yeah, well, for me, um, I, I think one of the keys, uh, again, this is all said in hindsight, right? I'm not sure I woke up one day and said, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Um, but so, so take it with a grain of salt that way. But I think the biggest thing that I did that, uh, that built the duct tape marketing brand is I had, I developed a very unique uh, point of view in the market. I mean, marketing is a system strategy before tactics, you know, content is the voice of strategy and you use uh, content to guide the customer journey. I mean, that's basically duct tape marketing in a nutshell. Um, and while that today maybe doesn't sound terribly revolutionary, <laughs> there, there were very few people talking about marketing as a system 15, 20 years ago. And so, you know, that was my way to say, okay, yeah, I'm just another marketing person, but you know, I've basically made the competition uh, irrelevant in some ways, uh, or at least incomparable by having this very set point of view. And then of course, obviously having a, a, a methodology to deliver it. Okay. So that's about being that guy or that girl. That's right. Right. And, and for the listeners to understand how that might relate to something that's even more understandable to them. For me, that same methodology is me talking in terms of magic words. It's that thread of content that right. becomes the thing you can hang your hat on in other different ideas. So it's, it's get that center of your message or tip of your arrow crystal clear and know it inside out and use that to pierce markets. Yeah. And, and I think the key to making that work is it has to be something that you can explain in, in 15, 20 words and somebody will go, Oh, I get that. Or I want that. Right. Uh, or that's, you know, nobody else is saying that. Why not? Um, that makes so much sense. I mean, obviously you've got to have a lot to back it up as you do with magic words. That's not just a little catchphrase, but, um, but, but uh, the key is getting that attention with kind of that simple, unique point of view. Gotcha. Okay. Now, again, you've been in this business a long time. I want to know about what are some of the big mistakes? What are the things that may be you've seen yourself or others do where you can give examples that might just hold up some signs or markers to the listeners right now to say, here, you could learn from this. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a couple of them. I mean, the, the biggest one, and I, you know, I did it, I think everybody does it, um, was, was not really understanding who made an ideal customer for me. And, and that word ideal is so crucial uh, when you get into this, because sometimes that can just be, you know, if you're a consulting firm and, and you're only going to work with 10 or 12 clients, uh, ideal might just be that you like them, <laughs> that yeah, yeah, yeah. spending time with them, that they, you know, you have shared values and, and principles uh, because there's, you know, nothing that will drain you faster than, than working with, with clients that when that, when you see their number on your phone, you're like, Oh God, <laughs> you know, not this. Um, so, so that, you know, that idea of really understanding and exploring who is ideal in such a way that you can actually go out and choose your clients rather than being chosen by them. Um, and that, that is, you know, such a freeing, uh, um, point of view of, uh, about marketing that I think a lot of people, you know, don't share. Right. Um, that's, so that's number one. Number two is, is this idea of not having some sort of core message that, that tells the world, here's how I'm different. And, and, and here's how I'm changing the entire context of how you think about sales training or marketing consulting or plumbing, even for that matter. Um, and, and that, you know, is something that, uh, you don't wake up one day and say, here's my magic thing. I mean, that's something that typically evolves, but you have to be looking for it. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you the, the way we find it for most clients is not by asking them, it's by asking their customers uh, right. that, uh, you know, what is it that, that Phil does that is magical. And a lot of times uh, they, they can articulate it far better <laughs> than the business owner because they've experienced it in, in a way that, um, that they can tell stories about, uh, quite frankly. And, and uh, so that's really where we kind of come up with that, that core message. That's gold. Yeah. And then the third one is to completely change your marketing message to be about your customer and not about you. <laughs> um, I can't tell you, you know, how many websites I go to and, you know, the first 2000 words are all about our great thing and what we do and all our awards and, and look at us and uh, the, the, the sites and, and businesses uh, that, you know, that really get making the customer the hero of the story. And we, the business owner, is the guide for to, to help this hero, you know, save his or her world. Um, is, is really how you have to look at all of your messaging. And, and, and if you start changing that, um, it will, you, you'll, you know, you'll go to your back to your website and you might throw up, um, <laughs> but, uh, but hopefully not. Um, right. uh, but I think that uh, is huge too, because I, I mean, when we go to a website, when we're looking for something or we have a problem we're trying to solve, we want to be hit right 
between the eyes about, you know, if you have <laughs> that thing, uh, you get me, um, you know, you, you are talking about the benefit uh, or the one thing, you know, that I want. Um, and, and a lot of times it's not what you sell. <laughs> it's what I hope that I can get from what you sell. So those three things, ideal customer, core message, and, and really change your point of view uh, from all of your messaging to being about the customer, not about you. So customer centric, that's that final point. And, and just a practical thing for listeners that they might be able to do with that point right now is, is like John said, read back through your copy, read back through your website, look for everything, but count the number of times you use the word are or the word we, that two letter word. Yeah. And, and I read like we pride ourselves on our customer service. We've been doing this and it's all nonsense or lies. There's no factual truth in most of it. And the overuse of the word we, just to put a visual image in the listener's mind right now, is like you weeing all over your customers. Okay. And um, yeah, it doesn't feel too good. So that's probably something to change. And, and John, just one final kind of sector to get into this interview. You're a kind of king of all things referral and referral system. Give me like three top tips that people could put into practice, some applicable information that can help them maybe up their referral game. Well, I, I, I did write a book about referrals. I would hesitate to call myself the king of referrals. I called you that. That's the thing is your customers have a better way of saying things <laughs> than you do, right? I just learned that. Um, I, I tell you the number one is to set the expectation. <laughs> if you're in a sales conversation with somebody and they're getting excited about what you're going to do for them or what you're talking about, um, use some variation of this phrase in every one of those conversations. Look, we know you're going to be so thrilled about what we agreed upon today that we're actually going to come back in 90 days and we're going to make sure you're thrilled. Um, and at that point, I'm going to ask if you'll introduce us to three other people you know need the same result. And it's such a positive message because you're basically saying you're going to be thrilled. We know you're going to be thrilled. We're going to come back and make sure you're Love, 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 love that. And, and, and guess what? They all say yes. And so now the expectation is that you are going to ask for referrals. Um, and so obviously you have to go back and do it. <laughs> but uh, but that uh, because they've said yes, they've agreed, uh, they, it's not going to be uncomfortable when you come back. And that's what I think happens with a lot of people is – it's not part of the deal. And so now you're coming back and asking me for referrals and it feels uncomfortable for both parties maybe. Um, but because they agreed, you know, up front, it, it's, it's the simplest and most powerful thing that you can do. Okay. Now a couple more is, uh, you, you know, even your best customers are busy. <laughs> you know, they, they have lives, they have things going on. They're not sitting around thinking about you, you know, 24 seven. So you have to make it easy for them to refer you. And in some cases, it might be as simple as once a quarter, send out a gift certificate and say, hey, use this to buy products or services, but here's another one to give to a friend and, and you know, give them something tangible that, uh, so when they've had that conversation with somebody, they go, oh, wait a minute, I know, here's this, <laughs> you know, go, go get this, uh, you know, this discounted service or this introductory offer. So, so put things in their hands, make it tangible. And then the third uh, thing, uh, I think you asked me for three, so here's number three, is uh, to, to create, you know, we all have those 20 percenters, you know, the, the people that do seem to sit around and think about you <laughs> a lot and think about yeah, yeah. ways to help you. So make sure that you build a community of, of, I call them champions, you know, those people that want to do stuff for you, let them help, you know, let them, let them uh, provide customer service for you, let them, um, you know, hold events so that they can meet each other and, and, you know, create a whole network of people, you know, maybe give them something, you know, once a year or something, but just really, really acknowledge the fact that, uh, that these are your champions. And, and, you know, you can do that in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure Phil in some of your group activities, you have some really active people that are just great go-getters and they talk about it and they recruit people for the community. Uh, those folks, you know, can almost become mentors inside of it and, and provide a whole nother layer uh, of success because, you know, I think there's so many companies out there that they, you know, here's our customer. We, we did what we said we would do. They paid us, you know, everything's, everything's great. And I think that when you get those evangelists and you, you know, really take care of them, uh, you will find that they will become a tremendous source of leads for you. Awesome. Awesome. Now, final question, just in terms of the interview is what's something I should have asked you that I didn't ask you that would allow you to convey maybe one of your best ideas, best stories, best pieces of information? You know, so many people do that interview technique, uh, what you just did there. <laughs> I always stumble on it because I just, you know, I just let it all out. You know, I don't hold anything back. And so I get to that question in the interview and I'm like, I don't know. I got nothing. <laughs> I, I think the biggest thing is, 
uh, if I'm going to give you, and I'm not saying that this is easy. This is something that takes work. It takes paying attention. It takes reaching out. But I think you, I think the, the, the strongest thing that you can do, because it will infuse all of your emails, all of your copy, all of your ads, is to understand why people really do buy from you. Um, and what I mean by that is, is in my case, nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to go out and get me a little bit of marketing consulting today. I mean, nobody <laughs> wakes up and says that, but they do say, I wish marketing wasn't so hard. Or they do say, how come my competitors are ranking higher than me in the search engines? And those kinds of trigger phrases are the types of things that I need to be communicating that I have an answer to. You know, these are the problems we solve should be a page of content on your website or, or in your sales uh, 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 little kit there so that, uh, that you can pull those out whenever you hear those kinds of phrases. Gotcha, gotcha, and that's really great advice. John, we're bringing the thing to a close and I wanna know what we can do for you. Now, we love your work. The guys in my group have been reading your book. They've been waxing lyrical about some of the takeaways they have as they work on through it. What are some of the things that we can do for you to help perhaps be some of those champions or advocates for you and your business? Well, um, you know, take a look at ducttapemarketing.com. Uh, that's, uh, that's where I hang out and put content. I love to hear from uh, readers. I'll tell you the one thing that if, if those of you that, that have picked up the book and read it cover to cover, um, <laughs> tell me what you've taken action on. Uh, write to me. It's just John at duct tape marketing. Write to me. Tell me what you've taken action. I love hearing that. I, I, you know, every time somebody says, Oh, we loved your book. It was awesome. I, I always <laughs> fire right back and say, what did you do? Because you read this book. And, um, I would you know love to hear that from you. Um, I, those of you that are, that are marketing consultants or uh, small agencies, or you want to be, uh, check out duct tape marketing consultant dot com because I'm I'm training and partnering with marketing consultants to to hopefully kind of save the world of small business one business at a time. Okay. And social channel wise, where's the best place that you hang out? Where do you have most of your conversations? Where do you want people to connect with you? Sure. Um, probably at uh, I, you know Facebook is uh, is probably the the place that I do the most com, um, communication and conversation these days. I was one of those people that started, you know, 10 years ago on Facebook or whenever they, whenever they allowed us uh, uh, old people in. Um, and uh, so I probably have as much on my, I don't use my personal profile for too much personal. <laughs> it's uh, kind of all mixed together. So it's just John Jance on duct tape Mark, or on uh, uh, Facebook. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, John, it's been an absolute blast having you on. It's really been great to get to know you. And thank you just for your honest conversational style and giving us some of the things that have come out of your experience. I know the listeners will have huge benefit. I've certainly enjoyed um, just getting to know a little bit more about how things work in your world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of Magic Mentor and helping us kick this show off with a bank. I appreciate it, Philip. A lot of fun.